And if you do still have questions, um, while I'm doing this, Alan's asking about uh, well-traveled nursery stock, Dakotas to Oregon to Minnesota. That's a lot of movement for uh, <laughs> trees to do just to make it to a nursery for, for us to buy. Yeah, you know, there's there. another problem with bur oak uh, is that it does have this big tap root, at least this upland type is, because that's part of its fire adaptation or these big tap roots. And so uh, I think they have problems with this variety of Levoformis in the nursery because they have to get almost all that big fat tap root <laughs> with the sapling in order to plant it. So they, I think they like this uh, Dakota type of Baroque better. It's a little easier to handle in the, in the nursery. At least right. that's what it was explained to me. Excellent. Really interesting stuff. Um, you, you know, I, how much, I guess one last question, how much do you think this applies to our, uh, our central and western Nebraska communities? Uh, Borough Blight in particular? Yeah, in, yeah. yeah, specifically. I'm guessing it's mostly an eastern Nebraska problem. Um, and you, you're probably getting into other types of, um, of Burr Oak as you head further further west. Um, so I, I think it's going to be mainly a problem on the east side and maybe southeast more. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about your soils. Right. But like the cemetery site, to me, it kind of looks like, you know, an upland site, not so much like the less hills type. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong. But yeah. if you have eastern Nebraska soils that are pretty well drained, from these wind-driven soils, um, I think you're going to get more of that Densiflora or uh, Depressa, variety Depressa type, okay. uh, where we don't see as much disease. So what little we've looked in eastern Nebraska, it's been pretty spotty. Okay. Yeah. It's not at all along the eastern part, but more so, I think, southeast than northeast. Right. And I'll definitely be keeping my eye out for some of those phenotypic differences in, in Burr Oak now um, that I've heard a little bit more about that and seeing what, you know, what experience tells me there. So um, part of what I didn't disclose earlier is that Bellevue Cemetery has been struggling with their stand of Burr Oaks for a while now. And I've been sort of at a loss as to what is actually going on in those trees and what sort of management recommendations to, to give to the city of Bellevue. And so, as most of you know, we were planning to do a site visit at the cemetery in conjunction with the in-person version of this event. And so in lieu of that, I did go back out to the cemetery a couple of weeks ago and got some photos that Tom and I can review and discuss that side in particular. And so it was really uh, interesting to hear you say that you see this in cemeteries a lot, mostly due to the topography and communities and where they end up establishing cemeteries often and uh, how that's kind of conducive to Baroque blight as well. And in, in, the, uh, in the chat, Alan was also mentioning that I failed to throw in a Bill Murray reference uh, with this whole talk with the what about Bob movie, <laughs> you know, what, <laughs> what, what about Bob, Tom, you know, how, yeah. how did, how is, how is Baroque Blight playing into the history behind this cemetery and what's going on there? Yeah. And I used to use this, what about Bob all the time? <laughs> I, I have a t-shirt that said life would be boring without Bob. <laughs> and so you know, I, it was kind of tongue in cheek. I called the disease Baroque blight because I thought right. there'd be some neat puns like that. And I, I used to say that I, I really don't like to work with foliar diseases because I like stuff that kills trees. Right. Uh, but this one, I made an exception and then it just kept pounding me and I wanted to do other work and I had to keep coming back. So it was kind of like the, uh, the Dreyfus psychiatrist you know that can't get rid of this guy right <laughs> so, so it fits with the movie yeah yeah definitely okay. so um as you can see in this uh this 
model from Google Earth, we do have the cemetery sited on sort of a, a bluff, if that's the right term to use. Um, definitely, there's been a lot of deforestation towards the bottom uh, edge of that, but we will visit a tree uh, towards the bottom here that uh, looks particularly nice. So here we have just a good photo of the interior of the cemetery. You can see we have kind of a substantial slope to the site. This is an east facing slope towards the, the river. Uh, and any initial thoughts on the context that we have these trees in, Tom? Well, I, I think this is pretty typical of cemeteries in, in Iowa too, in older towns, the county seats and, and stuff. Um, it's, it's actually probably pretty dense, uh, Baroque forest in this area, probably more dense than it was when there were regular prairie fires uh, in the area. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah. so a little bit denser burr oak than natural, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, because of fire suppression. Right. So the cemetery has been taking out some of these trees that are particularly declined or completely dead. Um, wh what kind of observations do you have on the stumps that we see in the site? So uh, this tree had a lot of decay in the root system and it starts in the roots and then moves, or maybe at the base where there's been a wound and you can see kind of in the lower right there, there's old healed over wounds. There were probably many wounds on this tree over the years and the wood decay fungi have gotten in and uh, they've been rotting the roots and rotting the base of the tree. And it looks like there was probably plenty of sap wood at the base level there to conduct water up to the crown of the tree. But probably as you go down, there's probably more and more rot with these, these things. And uh, so this tree probably had substantial branch dieback because of that decay of the root system. That's probably why it died. Two-line chestnut borer might have exacerbated it and hurried it along. But this is quite common for our old uh, burr oaks particularly those in areas where there's been a lot, a lot of mowing of lawns, in this case, backhoes digging graves, and putting in different roads and paths and stuff. Uh, they wound these trees and they get infected with wood decay fungi. These fungi move really slow. So that right. fungus may be in that tree for a hundred years. Right, <laughs> right. It out. And uh, the tree, you know, hangs in there for quite a while, but eventually, uh, it, you start getting the branch die back because there's not enough sapwood in the root system to conduct all the water that's needed. And you may see fruiting bodies show up on these trees, but often they don't. The fruiting right. bodies show up much later, sometimes not until after the tree's been cut down. Right. There's substantial decay here in the middle, as you pointed out, but, but little to no fruiting bodies present, at least, um, I mean, this tree's been cut down for a little while now, so they might have dried up and fallen off if they were present. Yeah. Um, I think it's safe to say that Quercus in general is really intolerant of soil disturbance and compaction and chopping at the roots, uh, particularly later in, in their life. So impacts are gonna be expected in a cemetery, as you said, where we've got existing trees that are big and mature and now we're coming through and having a lot of foot traffic and mower traffic and uh, digging around the trees. Yeah. So this was another stump nearby, uh, may or may not have similar things going on. We see some of the, the sort of brown discoloration associated with the, the rod in the center of the tree, but not as extensive root damage here. Uh, it, it might have been worthwhile for me to look at you know, how close were the grave sites to each of these stumps, but anything else to say on this one? Well, there could be a lot of decay in the root system. Oh, yeah. You don't know. Right. And there's lots of different fungi. There's, there's four or five of these that are pretty common on oak, different species, and some of them I, I've seen are deeper. You know, you see the fruiting bodies, but not much decay at, at, at uh, ground level. So, it, it could have been substantial. Hard to know, though, for sure. Right, right. Yeah, it's just a stump, after all. We don't have all the information we need. Yeah. So th this is your, your summer symptoms, one of the things that you see a lot mm -hmm. with those 
those summer uh, Iowensis infections. Yeah, if you had the fungus uh, Tabaki Iowensis moving down the leaves before it gets down to the petiole area, um, the leaf no longer is very efficient for photosynthesizing. And then we see the tree just casting off prematurely these, these leaves. So when we do have wet summers or even normal summers, we often see a lot of leaves on the ground around these bob trees. I think a lot of folks might benefit from a, a brief discussion about that abscission layer in, in the in the petiole and its function and, and how that function is disrupted sometimes. Yeah, so uh, in the fall, uh, there's a layer that it's right be where the leaf, the petiole beats the twig. And uh, so about this time that abscission layer starts to form. Uh, and then uh, in October or so, uh, there'll be, uh, uh, you know, a corky, a suberized layer showing up uh, there that will allow the leaf to fall off, you know, change right. color and then fall off. If, if that branch dies before that abscission layer is, it has completed, um, the leaves tend to hang on. And then right. with Bur oak blight with Tabaki ioensis, if the fungus infects endophytically, the first symptoms that show up is death of that abscission layer. So you could say the fungus is smart <laughs> to kill that leaf and keep it up in the crown, uh, but it's just natural selection. Right. You know, right. And, you know, and maybe this was a selection pressure for Tabaki on uh, sites that frequently had fires. And so instead of the inoculum, important inoculum on the ground that might get burned, uh, there was selection pressure for inoculum to be produced uh, up in the crown that hung over till the next spring. So. Right, right. And we, we do, it, 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 it is probably worth noting that there's a number of oak species that have that kind of uh, marcescent hanging on of leaves that's not necessarily associated with a disorder or disease, right? Well, yeah. So, uh, yeah, other oaks like a pin oak or something like that, red oaks, they'll hang on to a lot of leaves. Yeah. But bur oak normally does. Uh, it's usually uh, the individual leaf attachment area got killed or like a two-line chestnut bore kills an individual branch before those abscission layers formed. You'll have the dead leaves hanging on to. And I think we'll see another disease too, where the leaves hang on for the winter. That's not the bioensis. Yeah. So we will see that in a minute. And I, I do want to apologize. I was asked to uh, turn on the closed captions that are transcribing our, our dialogue here. There's a couple, there, there's some jargon we're using that's not quite translating well in that. And so <laughs> if there's any uh, clarification needed, please uh, mention that in the chat and we'll uh, you know, it, it keeps saying obsession instead of abscession. So we'll see whether or not we can correct that for anyone. So it's clear. So here are some leaves that, that I got some close up photos of kind of showing what we're seeing in the cemetery. Yeah, that's typical Baroque blight from the summer infections. And if you look kind of over um, on the right side where you see the underside of the leaf and look down, you'll see black areas on the main vein and then black areas on some of the main lateral veins. And those would be separate infections of Tabaki ioensis. Um, and then if you go up a little bit, you can see where some of that venal death, uh, the veins have coalesced and then the whole top 80% or so of the leaf has is, is died. Uh, but it starts off as individual infections on those veins, and then they grow down towards the main vein and then down towards the petiole with time. Right. And, and does this progression through the leaf affect the tree's ability to photosynthesize? Well, certainly the dead tissue doesn't photosynthesize anymore. So uh, yeah, there's not much coming uh, down into the sapwood uh, where the starch would be stored for overwintering. Uh, 
so it, it definitely does impede uh, the energy capacity, storage capacity of the tree. However, um, the symptoms usually don't progress very much until August or so. So the tree's already had a, a, you know, a couple, three months to, to store up energy. So yeah, those, it weakens the tree a little, but uh, not severely. Right? Yeah, not the way if it was doing this to the tree in May, for example. Oh, yeah. Then the tree would have a much bigger problem on its hands. That's right. So this kind of shows how this manifests on a whole branch. And we have some smaller twig dieback. We can see the brown versus the green in the foliage. And that's distributed pretty uniformly around this branch that we're looking at yeah. although as you said if we were comparing lower branches to higher ones we would probably see a difference there yeah certainly so it almost always uh, is more severe in the bottom half of the crown so the spores are splashed by rain so the raindrops splash down much more than they splash up so it's a pretty slow progression up uh, but once it gets up into the upper crown, it's on those overwintering petioles, so it's there, it's there to stay. But And this is an example, too, where the burrow blight's probably been severe enough that there's not enough energy stored up in those branches to keep them uh, healthy. So you see these small twigs dying back. Uh, it, we have seen that where we think it's just Tabachia ioensis is causing that little bit of twig dieback. But when it gets into any larger diameters, we've always seen this two-line chestnut or is the one that's killing the larger branches. Right. So we, we can see throughout the cemetery, really nice looking bur oak, fairly close to those that are much more severely impacted. So our, our root grafts, just not really a big factor in this disease moving through the forest. No, no, it would be if it's oak wilt. Right. You, and that's one of the things you'd see. If you look around and you start seeing a pocket of mortality mm -hmm. where it looks like it's spreading out from a focus to other trees, that's, that's a sign of oak wilt. Right, right. Uh, and none of these other diseases do that. Even the root rot, wood decay fungi, they don't really move from one tree to the next. So if you have oak wilt and it's been there for a while, you see these expanding foci of, of mortality. Right. Yeah. So we can look at that pattern of distribution, not only in a single tree, but amongst trees in order to differentiate oak wilt from bur oak blight a bit. That's right. Excellent. So this, this, uh, this dieback in the crown of the tree, probably not bur oak blight specifically related although we do see some burrow blight symptoms in what does is still leafed out. Yeah, I, I'm guessing there's substantial root rot in that tree, uh, you know, where they put in the pavements, they got uh, gravestones right up, you know, on the tree. So the root system was probably wounded, infected with these root rot fungi. And I'd hazard to guess that two-line chestnut borer would be up in those branches too. Right. So they're kind of working together to cause that branch die back. And those kind of trees, they don't really recover. Right. You know, once they get to that point, it's just kind of a steady progression. Sometimes it's all of a sudden it goes out at the two line chestnut borer, you know, overpowers the trees. But, but yeah. they, those are the kind of trees that uh, don't have much of a future. Yeah. And you think of all the energy stored in those roots that were severed at some point yeah. as well. That's true, that's yeah. true. So some more severely declining trees, <clears throat> excuse me, on the left side. Uh -huh. And then, you know, an example of some of the root disturbance that these trees are subjected to in a cemetery or just an urban setting in general. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of decay in there. And it may be uh, 10 or 20 years from now before it really catches up to the tree and you start seeing substantial branch dieback. Yeah, but we can see we can see the deterioration of the inside of that buttress root. And certainly that's translocating, you know, into the trunk to some degree. Yeah, it's cutting down on sap flow for sure. Right, right. 
So this is a tree towards the very top of the cemetery near the shop. Um, we, we see what could be perceived as some very minor Baroque blight symptoms from far away. Um, a, as we get closer in on the tree, uh, what, what are you seeing that tells us that there's probably not significant Baroque blight symptoms here? Well, um, two things. One, uh, the leaf mortality is scattered throughout the crown. So you could kind of even see that in the, in the slide before where um, if you could, if you got a good enough or the one before that. So you see there's little tan spots throughout the crown, <laughs> throughout the whole thing. And Baroque blight, we always see more in the bottom than in the top. Right. And usually the very top is green. Mm -hmm. Right. And in this one, there's some scattered dead leaves in the very top. Right. So it, it's different in that way. And then when we look closer, we'll see that it's individual branch tips that are dying and the leaves are hanging on. So this is probably Botryosphaeria tip like that's hitting those branch tips. And Botryosphaeria is also a, uh, a, a stress, a second secondary pathogen, so it hits stress trees. It causes uh, endophytic infections, so it's in those, even the healthy twigs on this tree. And then as the twigs become weakened, then it turns into a, a pathogen and kills that branch tip. So the way it's scattered pretty evenly throughout, this indicates this tree is in, under some general stress. Uh, it's not getting enough uh, water throughout that whole crown. It's pretty lush green crown. Right. Um, and it's just kind of a, a sacrifice of scattered tips throughout. It won't uh, affect the overall vigor of the tree. Um, so it's, it's a different type of disease and uh, it's, it's not really of concern. We see this a lot on yeah. different trees. I find it interesting that, you know, in the case of this tip blight, you have a disease that's sort of lurking in an otherwise healthy tree and just wait, you know, biding its time yeah. for individual twigs to, to start to uh, get stressed. Right. And then they come in and, and opportunistically take advantage of that stress. Yeah. But I think the tree has some control over which of those twigs are going to die. Really? <laughs> you know? Nice. Well, you know, it's it, it's not the whole branch. It's mm -hmm. really scattered tips throughout the crown. So it's it's right. a pretty good strategy, I think. If you can't support all the leaves, just um, you kind of decimate it, right? One tenth of the tips, yeah, uh, get killed off. And uh, yeah, pick your losses because you're going to have to, and uh, yeah. keep the rest looking good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so so these in, in in this photo, we can tell we're not looking at bur oak blight because we have a uniform brown color to the leaves that are affected, rather than kind of a a progression of that sort of mohawk, you know, the tip of the leaf, and then sure. moving down from there. In it, in even the dead leaves that you see, and so if this in the winter, you'll see these clusters of leaves at the tips that'll hang on right? Because those yep. leaves aren't upsizing like they should. Um, if it was bur oak blight, it would be scattered leaves. You don't see the clustering mm -hmm. at the tips. They're scattered throughout. So Right. And the, the veins and the, the, you know, the tissue that's affected and the veins that are affected in this picture are all kind of a uniform color too. Yeah, it's the Botryosphaeria isn't attacking the leaf. It's attacking that shoot that has maybe eight or so leaves clustered to it. Right. So it's actually right. hitting the branch tip, not the leaf itself. Mm -hmm. So no leaf symptoms, just dead yep. leaves in a cluster. Exactly. Then, and we do have those sort of larger acorns in this yeah. case that would tell us we might have that, that uh, subspecies or variety that is less susceptible to Baroque blight. Yeah, the, the variety Macrocarpa. So pure Quercus macrocarpa, variety macrocarpa has one to two inch acorns. These maybe are less than two inches, more closer to one inch or so. Mm -hmm. um, 
but uh, it's it's not the typical variety of Leviformis that we see Bob on. Right. Yeah. So that's interesting. I suppose that was a naturally established tree there. It's pretty old. Yeah. It wasn't planted, was it? No, I don't. And, and I don't think that most of the Baroque in this cemetery were uh, planted. Um, I'd have to get more natural history on the cemetery itself, but. Uh, yeah. But it looks pretty old tree. So. Right. Uh, yeah, I think we don't see that big of acorns in our, in our natural forest in central Iowa. We right. only see the small ones. So it's something different there. Good. Okay. So finally, this is kind of a favorite tree of mine in Bellevue and around the state in general. This is kind of when you picture a bur oak that you'd want to have in a commercial or on a on a poster somewhere or something like that. Uh, this is the kind of tree I think of. So this this is isolated a little bit from the others. We can see I, I put a little circle around kind of that tree in relationship to the rest of the cemetery. We do see some graves, but these are all very new graves. The tree has not had that soil disturbance and you know root disturbance associated with it throughout its life and much more recent activity around the tree. Any comments on this one? Beautiful tree. Yeah. Uh, and it's off on itself like it probably was in, a, in the pre-settlement forest. Uh, it looks like it's got a big swollen base to it, doesn't it? Yeah, I don't know if that's some grade change that has been done to well, the- Well, I've had know. some uh, uh, undis relatively undisturbed savanna groves where you see these huge sprawling, uh, it's like a stump, but it's got bark covering the top of it, but it's up above ground. Right. And uh, that would be, you know, a 250 year plus root system you know yeah that had sent up over the centuries over the decades many shoots that died to fire um some, I've, I've seen them too where they don't have even a, a main stem on them but the root system's still alive they're just kind of forked at the ground and going every which direction yeah sending out sprouts and stuff and, yeah and i wonder whether some of that is reaction wood to just wind load you know it's this tree is not sharing wind load with any others around it yeah it it could be but i think those kind of um, mounds <laughs> kind of a pseudo stump uh right. were common before when when there was prairie fires sure. where they died back in a prairie fire some sprouts had come out 10 years later another fire would kill all those sprouts and they just keep re-sprouting um, before fire suppression. So. so by the time you had a strong leader that, that, that persisted, you had quite a wide base to the tree already. That's right. Until okay. you had a sprout that finally had enough outer bark to withstand the fire. Yeah. Right, right. Interesting. Yeah. Always good stuff. Um, I'm going to stop my screen share here and take a look at the chat a little bit as we shift gears to our next topic. See if we have anything. Um, Alan was asking, oh, there's a couple of questions here. Um, hybrid columnar oaks and white oak group retain leaves in the winter. Yeah, that gets back to my marcescent question. There's some trees, particularly oaks that will hold on to those leaves yeah. normally. Yeah, sure. Uh, a question about tip blight versus twig girdling insects twigs on the ground as one way to determine, question mark? Uh, maybe, I'm not too familiar with twig girdler. Um, I know, I mean, I've had it pointed out to me before and seen it, but uh, with the tip light, if you look uh, at the base where the leaves are, dead leaves are hanging on, it'll be darkened, kind of black at that tip. And that's the fungus killing it. So the twig girdler, goes to a little bit bigger twig and then chews around it, you know, and it falls off. So if you, on the ground, it may be not as obvious, but certainly up in the crown. So we don't see with the tip light, we don't see twigs on the ground. You know, they die and hang on through the winter and you see the dead leaves hanging on. So 
Okay. It, it, I think it's pretty easy to tell them apart. Okay. Yep. Um, there's a question about the uh, the tip blight when we were discussing that. Is there a correlation with uh, you know chlorosis, iron deficiency, and how prevalent that tip blight is? Um, particularly regarding pin oaks that of course we're seeing a lot more of that sort of problem with. Yeah, I'm, I'm tempted to try to point my camera to the shingle oaks and red oaks outside my window <laughs> because it's on a street where we've had uh, iron chlorosis problem and sure. they keep wanting to plant. <laughs> shingle oaks are real susceptible to it and they've lost most of them. So they started planting red oak in its place and, and they're going through the same thing. And now this summer, because we had a pretty bad drought here, we see a lot of the Botryosphaeria tip light. Right. And it's worse on the chlorotic trees, the ones that are going sure. through the tip light, uh, that are going through the iron chlorosis. So uh, I think they definitely interact that we see on the trees with iron chlorosis, we see more of this Botryosphaeria tip light. Right. And yeah, sort so of they stress factor that lets them get a foothold. Yeah. And so there's a couple of trees right outside my window that they'll be removing in the next year or two. You know, they're starting to show more branch dieback and yeah. Worse tip light, but I think it's really set up by the iron chlorosis. So yeah, I think that's a good point. I think they definitely interact. We don't see that in the burrow. We don't get that iron chlorosis symptoms. I think they're better adapted to our relatively high pH soils. You know, sometimes yeah. we see some chlorosis in the white oaks, but in the bur oak, we don't, we don't see that, so. Yeah, same on this side of the river. It's mostly those, those pin oaks um, that we see a lot of chlorosis on. Yeah. And boy, did we really like planting those about 30, 40, 50 years ago. They were all over. <laughs> uh, and they're still all over. They're, they're just big trees that are still kind of chugging along in spite of that, that iron deficiency. Yeah, they can. Yeah but stress nonetheless. Uh, last question, uh, Anita was asking about that beautiful tree that we ended on. Now that we're seeing some ground disturbance, would we expect similar symptoms in that tree in the coming years? Maybe coming decades. Coming decades, right. Because the, the, these root rotters, these wood decay fungi, uh, they're really slow. Right. So it really takes, you either have to remove a lot of the root system Mm -hmm. you know like over half right uh to see some branch dieback showing up right away mm -hmm. or uh, you have to give those fungi decades to really right. do their thing so it's that fortunately it's really slow moving and uh you know to my way of thinking if i was the grounds person <laughs> in that cemetery i would say really stay away from the roots right as best you, know? you can yeah as far as you can uh but, you know, maybe, you know, at this point, there hasn't been a lot of disturbance and it'd be all right. If you put a road up right next to it, that would be a bad thing. <laughs> right. You know, it's one of those cases where we tend to love trees to death sometimes. Yeah, we do. And, and, I, and I, you know, no, no pun intended in a cemetery context uh, talking about death, but um, people want to be buried under a tree a lot of times. And I think that's Part of what's driving the locations that plots are being utilized in yeah um you know there are wind chimes hanging from that tree that tree that we looked at that looks beautiful people really like that tree there's a there's even a trash can nearby just so that as people are there doing whatever they're doing visiting uh dead loved ones um you know they want the area to look nice and serene and peaceful and the tree plays a big part in that and so unfortunately, the tree is going to bear some of the impacts of us wanting to be in and around it, even in our resting places. Yeah, you could put, you know, some iron fencing around it, around the base. Right. And put mulch within there, to keep the lawnmowers away. Yeah. Yep. So a lot of trees get killed by a disease that I call lawnmower blight. Mm-hmm. You know, and they bang yeah. into the root systems, the wood decay fungi get in, and it does week take week. decades, but um, it, it's bad. So I think the important thing would be to keep the lawnmowers away from that tree. Yeah, yep. And Alan makes a point that if they wanted to preserve this tree, 
they could create sort of a perimeter within which there aren't any graves dug that were for, you know, ash deposits. Uh, people could be cremated and, and oh, have yeah. their ashes deposited there yeah. and still, you know, rest with the tree and nearby the tree without having the same sort of impacts that a backhoe and, yeah. uh, you know, m you know, mower blight, as you put it, and uh, foot, even foot traffic, you know, that chronic compaction from yeah. people can, can do a number on a tree over time. Yeah. All right. Good discussion. So, so that was the cemetery that kind of got my mind working on getting this workshop together. And I appreciate all your thoughts on that cemetery. I think they apply to any cemetery here in the, in the Great Plains with that oak component, bur oak component. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, I will transition to our next speakers here.